Welcome to another episode of the Gay Archive Show, where we explore gay history one bar at a time. I'm your host, Art Smith. Our guest today is Dr. Eric Gonzaba, professor at California State University Fullerton, and the driving force behind Wearing Gay History and Mapping the Gay Guides. So welcome to the show, Eric. Thank you so much, Art. It's a wonderful to be with you all, and I'm a big fan of the site, so it's great to, it's great to be on. Well, thank you. And your projects are pretty extensive, too. You know, a lot of the historians I've spoken to uh, in the realm of, of gay bars and gay entertainment have been people that are in their 50s, 60s, 70s. They've been around for quite a long time. You obviously have not been. Um, but yet, you seem to have made a mark um, on recording gay history and doing projects that are engaging and informative and and immensely valuable. Uh, one of them that I just discovered today was that you were involved with the Rainbow History Project for a little bit. Yeah, so uh, I was involved in the Rainbow History Project. I actually moved to Washington, D.C., or at least the Washington, D.C. area. I went to grad school at, at George Mason University um, after undergrad at, at Indiana University. So I moved out to D.C. Um, in, uh, oh gosh, 2012. Um, and while I got involved there, I didn't think of myself as a gay historian just yet, but very quickly I realized that my passions were really, were really in LGBT history. Um, and so I, I looked for organizations that were collecting historical stuff. Um, and I realized very quickly that in most cities around the country, uh, archival projects are not usually funded by, you know, the big wigs, by the big city museums or and, and whatnot. And it was usually, you know, historically, um, LGBT archival projects and history societies were founded by just a few people who were interested in saving their stuff. And one of them um, was the Rainbow History Project in Washington, D.C. Um, they helped me locate some information, some, some archival stuff that I needed. And I realized that it'd be great to know more about them. They invited me to be on their board. Um, and the Rainbow History Project is still running well. It has a great active board um, with incredible archivists, and volunteers, and um, historians. Uh, and they do incredible work saving the history of sexually diverse communities and metropolitans in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I was quite proud to be on their board for a couple of years. Well, I'm glad you were. And I, I have, um, over the course of my 90 plus interviews that I've done, I've interviewed several people from the DC area and learned a lot about DC history myself. And I was, of course, familiar with the Rainbow History Project. Um, my project kind of started in a little bit different way. Um, I was working on a, on a commemorative project for one specific bar in Atlanta called Backstreet. And in the course of the project, I started talking to people about a lot of other bars that I remembered and, you know, we collectively had gone to. And I noticed that a lot of their logos and imagery were not recorded anywhere. People knew that the bar existed, but nobody knew what the logo looked like because there were no relevant copies anywhere. And so I started focusing on the, the logos first. So and cool. um, over the course of the last couple of years, I've reconstructed digitally a couple thousand of those um, those logos, but um, that brought me to stumble across one of your other projects, which was kind of near and dear to my heart, was the Wearing Gay History uh, mm -hmm. project because that takes a little bit different look at our gay history through T-shirts mostly. Sure. Uh, um so first of all, I have to say your collection, your your, your kind of entryway into in, uh, his, uh, creating historical archive of these logos, is such an interesting nod to how so much gay history has been saved by people like you who are just genuinely interested in, in saving our own history when other people are not doing it. So I applaud you for that. I think it's just a, it's a great example about how queer people have had to take uh historical archiving, historical collecting into our own hands because other people are not going to do it. Uh, but Wearing a History is a good example of a project that could really kind of introduce me um, to LGBT history as a field in general. Um, I, it, it's actually origins begin when I was an undergrad. Um, when I was an undergrad, I wanted, I first got, kind of got interested in history in undergrad, my very first semester in college. I, I had a great historian, uh, uh, a teacher of mine named Michael McGurr, who made me fascinated by this magical world called history. It could be a career maybe. Um, and I knew by senior year of, 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 of um, 
of undergrad, I wanted to do something about uh, the queer history of where I grew up. And I grew up in Southern Indiana, the rural Southern part of Indiana, uh, a, a town called Corden. And if you're from Indiana, you probably know Corden because you're, you're, I think you're forced to learn about Corden in fourth grade. Indiana history is the first state capital um, of, of the state, but a really a relatively small town. Um, and I felt, even though I came out in high school and I I it was a pretty, I had a, a very accepting family when I felt like I was like the only queer person in Harrison County, Indiana, in Southern Indiana. Um, and I learned very quickly that was not the case, that like there were queer people who were living in Indiana. All of gay history is not uh, taking place in just San Francisco or New York, which, you know, every, every major history book that I was reading, it felt very much like gay history was only in the major metropolitan areas and not in some place like Indiana. And so I wanted to prove, you know, people wrong that like there, there was queer history in places like Indiana, right? Um, and so I looked for ways to prove that. And I learned like just via the glory of the internet, I Googled like gay Indiana history and kind of in a random spot, uh, this uh, in a, kind of a nod to people, you know, taking history into their own hands. I found a man named Michael Bohr who actually had his own gay archives in Indianapolis open one day a week, I think on Sundays uh, from like eight to five. And he collected books about gay people, um, Indiana gay magazines. Uh, and I was like, oh, this is good. This is great. I'm going to talk to Michael Bohr. I'm going to come here and I'm going to find some textual documents, which all historians love textual documents, right? Our, um, photographs, but also, you know, newspapers. And I was going to prove that Indiana had a, a vibrant gay community. And I got there and he had all that kind of stuff. But once the uh, one couple of boxes that he had not yet processed or not yet, you know, shown researchers yet, um, I opened up and it was a smelly box because they, they were t-shirts in this box that had not been had not been washed. Um, but Michael Bohr, I collected these t-shirts while working, I believe, at uh, an HIV AIDS um, kind of thrift shop in Indianapolis. And he kept, he kept saving shirts that um, were were from gay bars uh, that that were famous in Indianapolis, or they were from LGBT bowling leagues, or they're from uh, I don't know uh, um, LGBT TV uh, watch parties or something. And he collected these t-shirts and I just had this idea like, wow, what a great way of like trying to celebrate a community that like is not in hiding, right? Like these, these t-shirts were being worn by queer people trying to express that they were gay. I thought that was a fascinating uh, uh, project. So I, I brought several, several t-shirts back to Bloomington. I created this exhibit that was just uh, a kind of a public uh in-person exhibit. I put it away after it got, it got displayed um, at, my, at my university. I didn't think about that. But then when I went to grad school a couple of years later, I went to a posh, relatively posh party in DC when I first got to DC. And I, I was telling people about like my interest in LGBT history, especially in rural spaces like Indiana and whatnot. And a lot of the gay guys at this, at this party I were at were laughing at me a little bit, being like, well, the reason why you're not finding lots of stuff in Indiana uh, is because most gay history didn't happen in Indiana. It's happening in places like New York. And I, this is the one thing that made me like super mad. It was like, no, there's gay history everywhere. It's not just in the major cities, right? A lot of it's in the cities, but it's not just in the cities. And so I wanted to tell people about this project that I did using these t-shirts, but there's no way to do that. I couldn't show them this exhibit other than I guess um, photographs of the exhibit or something. Um, and so luckily I went to George Mason University and at George Mason at the history department, they really train you there to do what we call digital history, these digital methods um, to try to learn something about history that you wouldn't know otherwise. And so while I was there, I built this kind of first archives of LGBT t-shirts or digital archives of LGBT t-shirts. I'm not an archivist. It is not, you know, the... Uh, I'm sure the American Archival Societies or whatever probably think it is a trash website, um, but it's my version of trying to collect LGBT history via t-shirts. Um, and I first started with the Indiana archives, but then I started you know, applying for different pots of money. And I got to travel to something like 12 or 15 different LGBT archives around the world and photograph their t-shirts, create metadata, and allow people to see that LGBT history is not just in major cities, it's also in rural towns across the country, but also it's an international um, uh, project as well. It has t-shirts from not just, you know, Western Europe, but it has t-shirts from Sri Lanka and from uh, the first pride parades in Shanghai and uh, t-shirts in, in South Africa too, right? Um, telling us that queer culture is really an international um, phenomenon and something to really cherish. And so um, I hope people, and now it's the project has been going on now for about five or six years and i slowly updated over time i work with archival partners we're going to be adding harvard's uh, collection of t-shirts relatively soon hopefully the lesbian history archives in the next couple of years um but allowing people to see that to, to uh, a different way of imagining gay history that isn't just solely focused on textual documents um and something about t-shirts is really um is really near and dear to my heart well and i think a lot of people can relate to them especially younger people you know anybody that 
that came of age, you know, in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, and beyond, T-shirt is a staple part of, you know, of your wardrobe. I mean, totally. you know, if you go back to people that were running around in the 40s and 30s, not so much, but it's really become an iconic part of, of you know, the American wardrobe, especially when it, when it relates to entertainment and leisure. I mean, every... Right. Every band concert in the world has a commemorative T-shirt. Every bar, every everywhere, there's every a parade and event and festival has T-shirts all over the place. It's the way we kind of commemorate the things that are important to us and the things that we celebrate. And, yeah, and um, one, it's one slice of queer history too. I want to make that important. Like you said, like in the 40s and 50s, you don't see a lot of T-shirts coming out, mostly because T-shirts are not yet really a popular outward clothing item. Mostly right. they're worn, and not until like the you know Rebel Without a Cause era, the 50s, then they become outward apparel. But they're mostly undershirts, right? But by the 60s and 70s, especially in the 70s, T-shirts are relatively inexpensive to print. Many people are printing them at their own house, right? And it becomes kind of like you said, a kind of a cultural. Um, uh, a kind of a cultural messaging system and people realize you can like really sell an activist t-shirt and put whatever you want on it and I also think talk about like gay bars creating their own t-shirts sometimes t -sh these t-shirts are the only real surviving artifact of these bars right when the bars close maybe if you're lucky you can find matchbook covers that have the address in the bar but what I've noticed that like sometimes the only you know real evidence left of these bars standing other than them being printed in some like, kind of guidebook which is another project I worked on is these t-shirts that the bartenders wore or that people bought at the at the bars themselves and so they're really kind of incredible um archival um remnants of of, of these of these spaces who are no longer uh, are there well absolutely and some of these people that you mentioned that that may turn their nose up at the project and say well you know it's not a proper archival project that you know in my opinion especially when you're dealing with a cultural element like this like you know gay nightlife gay entertainment gay lifestyle you want something that can relate to the people. You're not mm -hmm. trying to impress some pedagogue up on a pedestal somewhere. You're trying to relate to the people that experience those things. And so to me, in a lot, in a lot of ways, these type of projects uh, commemorating the t-shirts and, and things of that nature are as important, if not more so than these, you know, fancy academic, you know, dissertations on what was going on in the gay world. Totally. And I think and I think there's a there's a middle ground there. Right. It's not we're not totally rejecting, you know, the the academy's embrace of trying to create. There's a reason why the academy is trying to build really fancy databases and archives. Right. Because, you know, we should have standards for stuff. But you don't want to you if in so much accessibility and I mean, accessibility, not so much in like disability studies, words of accessibility, but accessibility in terms of having the public engage with our work you know the whole point of history is that people need to learn their own history and engage in historical work and it's it's uh, it's websites like yours that really get people you know to really you know think about um the spaces they visited in a different way than if they were only you know oral histories that were in an archival space um in you know in Los Angeles or something, right? And so sites like like your site and Mac and the Gay Guides and Wearing Gay History, there are ways to get the public excited about it, even if they don't meet the incredible metadata standards put right. upon them by the academy. And I'll just say on the other set though, like we're all learning, right? Like as we we're as as we're our rudimentary archivists, I don't know if we're rudimentary, but as we keep doing our work, we're learning ways to improve ourselves. And so it's not like we're stagnant and saying no to the academy. It's just that it's going to take us a little bit longer to learn because we don't have that formal training that other people um, have been privileged to have. So. Yeah, and I'm I'm certainly um, you know in favor of supporting all the academic efforts as well. I've we were talking earlier and I mentioned that on my, on my website, I have an archives page that mm -hmm. lists um, the websites of, of LGBT archives around the country and some across the world, because we need those too. I mean, we need oh, amazing. Yeah. And the one thing that's a little bit unfortunate, I think uh, in some ways you've kind of bridged this gap with some of your projects, but a lot of the projects that I've seen are uh, kind of exclusionary. Like, you know, one archive will act like the other ones don't exist. They don't cross-reference. They don't interconnect. They don't share the availability of information on other platforms. They just act like they're the only one. You came to our website. This is the gay history. And don't look anywhere else because it's not there. Um, but um, You're I totally right about that. 
And the other thing too, is that like a lot of these digital archives, like yours and all, all of my, a lot of my, not all my work, a lot of my work, you know, there is a, the other major threat to some of these uh, sites is that just because they're online does not mean they're going to be online forever. One of the things you'll note, I'm sure as you, you know, like you are scouring the web looking for LGBT archival links or historical links. And a lot of them you click are all dead, right? And it tells you about the fragility of doing your work online is that some ways there's, there's a nice thing about working with, you know, institutions institutions like the academy or other institutions, right? Because hopefully they'll they'll figure out ways of saving that material. And so I always tell people like, just because you post it on the web does not mean it's there forever, even though there's a there's a myth about that, right? It's easy for even major funded, you know, uh, $100,000 projects can sometimes, if they don't think about uh, uh, preservation, can easily uh, be erased in a couple of years or in 10 years or whatever. Um, and, and that's unfortunate. So it's, it's really important for people who, even when they're doing early, you know, LGBT historical work on, digitally, should think about ways of trying, how are they going to preserve their work for the future when their, their website is no longer uh, operational? Now, you, you kind of um, touched on the third project that uh, you were very involved with. Uh, which is called Mapping the Gay Guide. And I learned about that probably close to a year ago uh, when I was interviewing the woman who now owns Damron Guide, uh, Gina Gatta. And um, she had mentioned you and, and your project. And obviously Damron Guides are a big portion of what Mapping the Gay Guides is all about. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that project and you know how it came to be and what exactly it, it's doing? Sure. So Mapping the Gay Guides is a digital, uh, what we used to call a digital mapping project, but really it's, a, it's just a digital historical project. And I'll talk about why I mean uh, saying a digital historical project. And what we're doing, um, and I say we because the team who founded Mapping the Gay Guides is myself, who leads the LGBT kind of content component of the site. But the digital heart of the site is the brainchild of, of my partner who I went to graduate school, not, not my <laughs> relationship partner, but my, uh, my business partner, if you will, um, Dr. Amanda Reagan, uh, who is now a professor uh, of, of history at Clemson University. Um, and she really is the is the is the uh, head of the digital component of the site. But what Mapping the Gay Guides actually is, is we're taking these, what we call, Dam what, 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 we're, what we're called in the day, the Damron address books. Uh, and these were LGBT, I should say, mostly gay at the beginning of it, uh, gay men's kind of travel guides that began being published in 1964 um, out of San Francisco in California. And they, at the initially, it kind of served a similar function as the African American Green Books, and these were books being sold to African Americans um, in the Jim Crow South, but also in the Jim Crow North, that allowed people, especially uh, Black people, to find places um, that were safe when they were traveling around the country places that they knew they were not going to be harassed um, by racist uh, uh, diner owners or hotel owners or like that. And these gay guides were kind of similar. And um, and the, there were many different gay travel guides that were being published as early as the 1950s and into the 1960s. And so we could have chosen any one of these to try to investigate kind of ignored queer geography. But we chose the Damron guides and that began published in 1964. And there are a couple of reasons why we chose the Damron guides. One is, at least my research, um, I just just trying to interview people and kind of seeing how Damron is being understood. Damron's guides were considered the gold standard in the gay travel guide industry um, very early on. Not to say that his guides were perfect and they're, they're not perfect by any means, but they're really, they're relatively, um, they were, they were more accurate than a lot of other guides were. And I know that because a lot of other guides would just simply copy Dan Ron's own guides. That's how much um, uh, imitation is the greatest form of flattery, right? So in that imitation told us that perhaps we should look at the Dan Ron guides a little more closely. And the other reason why we like the Dan Ron guides is that unlike so many of Dan Ron's competitors, uh, the Dan Ron guides last into the 2020s. In fact, I think the last guide, I'm get, Gina's gonna be mad at me. I think the last guide is 2020 or maybe 2021, a uh, black, black uh, edition of the guide. Uh, but the other guides do not last that long. And so to find a guide that lasts nearly 60 years allows us to see kind of to track major changes over time in the gay community um, since 1964. Um, now, just to tell you a little bit about what these address books look like. They were very tiny, at least initially they were they, they, they were able to fit in your pocket. Um, I should have had some. I'm, I'm, I'm working on a project and I, so I have a lot of them with me, but they're not here, unfortunately. Um, but these these are interesting. They, they listed almost every single state in the union and, and eventually they're going to list international locations 
applications. Um, but all Damron did, and I say Damron because the founder of the guide uh, was named Bob Damron, a very famous uh, gay bar owner, especially in San Francisco. Um, but he included the name of the state and then he included the city um, and then he included mostly bars, but other places as well, bathhouses, gay restaurants, gay bookstores, um, other places, gay businesses. And he would list the business, the bar, and then he would include really interesting information um, about these spaces. And the way he told you about this information was he sometimes added description information, but a lot of times he just used a lettering system that he developed himself. So for instance, if a, if a bar was mostly uh, frequented by black patrons, he would include the letter B for blacks frequent. Or if it was a, a women's bar, um, he would include the letter G for girls, or eventually he would change the letter to L for ladies. Or if it was um, a place with a pool table, he would include the letters PT next to it. Um, and th and these, these letter systems can be understood at the very beginning of the guide. He included a nice uh, code for people who were unfamiliar with this. Um, and so we thought it'd be interesting, not only, I mean, the reason why I got involved in the mapping project in general, I thought about doing this mapping project, was because when I was writing my dissertation in Washington, D.C. at George Mason, University, I was I was writing a chapter of my dissertation about nightlife, but the chapter I was writing was about black gay bars. And the problem I had was, I mean, I didn't have too much of a problem in the sense that I, I was talking to lots of black gay men about the bars they went to, but they kept mentioning names and some of them had addresses, but or like it was on the corner of P Street or something. And I didn't have a great list. And I was like, I need some kind of definitive list. And so I looked to the Bob Dameron guides and I looked for all of the DC spots that had the letter B and it wasn't a perfect list, but it gave me a start. Um, and my, my project partner, Dr. Amanda Reagan made a really, after my dis dissertation defense, she said to me, you know, Eric, we can look at this. You can use this Dameron, uh, these, these Dameron address books and look at them as data and try to see them kind of from a step back. Can we learn anything about the trends as we step back? And that's what we were hoping to do with this project. The thing about digital history is that, and, and about all histories, that we have ideas, but until you actually do the research, do you actually um, do you actually learn something about the, the work that you're doing? And so we had we had hypotheses, but until we're now actually gathering the data and getting to analyze that data, now it's at this stage that we're finally learning things that we didn't know about the gay community beforehand. And so right now we have all of the American data from the Dameron Guides on the website, mappingthegayguides.org from 1965 to 1980. In just a few weeks, we're gonna release the data from the first half of the 80s, from 81 to 85. And then um, and as the next year and a half goes, we'll be releasing all the data uh, up into the year 2005, and which is not the complete data set. The data set goes all the way to 2020, as I mentioned before. Um, but right now we just have funding to, to hit 2005. And so uh, right now you can only see to 1980. We're really excited as that new data gets launched in the next couple of months and in, in the next year or so, we can track um, the gay community as it enters the AIDS crisis of the 1980s, um, as it enters the, the, uh, the political battles of the 1990s, um, as it enters the Supreme Court battles of the early 2000s. And we're really excited to see um, how historians take our data and learn something about it, uh, about the gay community they, they didn't know beforehand. And I think it'll also be helpful to um, to watch the numbers, because I know on, on your site, it shows how many uh, entries exist in 1964 or 1980 or whatever. And right now, the way it seems to be trending from what I, you know, looking at your website, is that there was a dramatic increase from 1964 to 1980 in the number of um, gay establishments that were recorded, not only in the entire guides, but even in, if you pick any individual city or state, um, they're all dramatically increased, you know, five, six fold, sometimes tenfold over that, that time frame. And I think we're going to start to see something uh, a little bit different when you get into the next stage, because They'll continue for a while to increase, and then you'll have some fluctuations with age closures and and how different things impact um, the the whole nightlife scene, and then probably another increase, and then eventually, as we know now, um, it'll start tapering off into the twenty you know late twenty tens and early twenty twenties. Well, it's funny that you say that because it it it's it is while well, we're working on the seventies data. 
incredibly important time for uh, queer history, right? It is funny because that by if we ever saw there was a dip in the numbers, we knew that we had messed up. We forgot to add California or something because we we should expect a a, a steady rise in the number of queer establishments uh, in the 1970s. Um, but to your other point, I mean, in some ways, the, the sheer number, the, just looking at the numbers, is not the only way of, of using mapping to gay guides. But the numbers is actually the first kind of thing that taught me that I was wrong about a long a long held assumption that I had had about LGBT history, which was, you know, coming of age as a queer historian, you're always trying to find the new, the new cool historical idea, the new histor queer historical fact. And I don't know, I was, I don't know what, about, I study nightlife, so I shouldn't have cared about this so much, but I felt like coming of age as a gay historian, I got so tired of reading about everyone caring about Stonewall. Not to say Stonewall wasn't important, but I was just like, there's just no way that this bar raid in New York had as much of an impact nationwide as everyone makes it out to be, right? And there's some evidence that I was right about this, right? Like not every queer person living in, I don't know, in Houston, Texas was reading in, in June of 1969 or July of 1969 the next month about this riot in New York, right? Um, for me, like the most transformative, you know, really nation building LGBT historical moment in American history is the Anita Bryant campaigns, right? Because that really galvanized the whole nation. But like I said, like his, being a historian is learning to, learning from your mistakes and learning, doing projects and figuring out that you were wrong in the past. And doing that in the gay guides taught me that like, I'm looking at Dan Ron's data from 1964, 1965, 1966. And you know, there's a steady rise in gay culture and in gay and the number of gay sites, you know, but from 69 to 71, 72, you see those numbers jump. And it teaches me that like, whether or not everyone knows about this gay riot in New York, there is something happening in uh, gay American communities nationwide around the time of Stonewall. And that really is a transformative event. And that's teaching it someone like me, a historian of gay culture, that I shouldn't be so dismissive of that Stonewall narrative because it really is an, an important event for queers nationwide. Yeah, it is. But there's also, you know, some other arguments I've heard that, you know, you're getting into the kind of free love generation and the Woodstock mm -hmm. era and all this True. that changes the mentality of how people think about expressing, you know, your your affections and things of that nature. Sure. Um, and of course, other uprisings in different parts of the country um, in California, both in San Francisco and Los Angeles with the two black cats. Sure. Um the Cooper's Donuts event in 1959. There's so many of right. them that kind of build up to this, this crescendo. Sure. Um, but it was, it's kind of interesting to me to see how these all play out and how the, the numbers change. I know I moved to Atlanta uh, in 1983 and I moved there because of the gay scene. So I had been, I had gone to college in Nashville. I was living there. I met a new boyfriend. We decided to spend our first New Year's Eve together in um, Atlanta because awesome. it was only a few hours away. We went down there and we were blown away by the bar scene and the, and the gay community there in 1983. So much so that at the end of the weekend, before we headed back to uh, Nashville, we looked at the newspaper, uh, checked out an apartment, put down a deposit, started the utilities. Um, I went and applied for a job, to, went to a job interview and got hired. And we awesome. moved there the next weekend. Amazing. And, so it really drew you there. Yeah. And that bar was Backstreet, which, oh, uh, cool. which yeah, lasted cool. 30 years as the kingpin of the Atlanta gay nightlife. But at that time, Atlanta and so many other cities. I mean, you can look at Chicago, Milwaukee, Los Angeles, New York, wherever. They had many, as possibly the, the biggest number of gay bars that they ever had in those cities. I mean, I can think of at least 30 or so gay bars in Atlanta in the early 80s when I was there that, that were you know, well-known and well, well visited. They weren't holes in the wall or whatever. Um, right. I, I think it's part of part of the argument I'm trying to make in this book that I'm writing now, kind of a, uh, a branching off of my dissertation, which focused on um, post Stonewall, D.C., Baltimore and Philadelphia, this kind of mid-Atlantic cities, just for about 25 years or so, is I try to make an argument that like, 
so much of, of our understanding of gay history is politically focused, right? Of like, which gay people are being elected to Congress and, you know, what are the fights to, you know, the AIDS crisis is all about politics, right? But I think right. there's a cultural element that is not ignored, but can, can be brought to the forefront. And I try to make an argument, I'm trying to make an argument now as I write the book that like, there is a nightlife focused culture among queer communities, especially gay men, right? Um, beginning in, in the early 1970s and into the 1980s, where there are many people who are going to the bars, not because they're interested in, they, they, they see themselves as gay activists or they care about the gay rights. I'm sure they like, they, if they had to vote on it, they would vote for pro-gay causes. Don't tell me that. But I mean, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that a lot of people are going to the bars to escape you know, the worries of the work week and homophobia during the work day. Right. And it's, it's this kind of like, it's like you said, like there are, there are gay people going to Atlanta, seeing the amazing club scene and are going to move there the next week. Right. Like it's a great example about like, there's a forward thinking, like we can create our own community. We can have a hedonistic pleasure centered um, lifestyle that was denied to us for so many years, you know, growing up. Uh, and I think that's a really important argument that needs to be explored and, and, and a world that needs to be explored. And I'm excited to, to do some more work on it. Yeah, and it was a, a completely different time. I mean, I went to my first gay bar experience in in the um, general vicinity of where you, you did a lot of your research. My very first gay bar experience was in Baltimore at the Hippo mm. in 19. 19- oh, wow. Yes. Very cool. um, my boyfriend from high school had gone to college at Johns Hopkins. I went down there to uh, visit him. We went to dinner. And uh, he said, let's go to a bar. And we walked a block or two away and he brought me into this bar. I had no idea it was a gay bar. Um, Ordered a drink. I'm standing there for about five minutes looking at the dance floor and drinking my drink. And suddenly I looked at him and I said, everybody on the dance floor is male. (laughs) It was like, what the fuck? Um, and, And that was kind of a revelation because back then you didn't necessarily know that there was even a society that there was a gay society it was just you know i'm some weird guy who you know has a friend that i like to kind of fool around sexually with but i don't know what that means it's not i'm not going to marry him i mean you know that thought process just didn't exist in my mind um right and, and so that's, the, that's it i'm oh, sorry i didn't interrupt you I apologize. the bar the bars were what allowed us to express our our thoughts and feelings and to work through these ideas and and organize into all these groups that we eventually had to help fight for you know for our freedoms right 100 percent. i mean and that's kind of the important part about like which is kind of the sad thing about like losing these gay commercial spaces today you know a lot of i get interviewed sometimes by the press and they're always like you know what do you think about like the fact that some gay bars, some communities are losing their gay bars and their lesbian bars, whatnot. Like, and, and some of it's like, well, you know, different times. You know, some people always say, you know, queer people are integrating into the, their quote unquote straight bars or whatever, right? Um, or they're, you know, they're having house parties or something like that, that or underground, you know, parties or whatever. But there's something to me, like, uh, come my, which I think I grew up in a different era than you, but, you know, for me, when I was coming of age, like, as a high schooler, like as a gay kid, like for me, seeing knowing there was a gay bar in Louisville, Kentucky, or Indianapolis that I wanted to go to, like that was to me, like that's where I was going to be re-educated and understanding what it meant to be gay. And I couldn't wait to get a either to get my regular ID at 21 or hopefully get a fake ID to go into those gay bars. And to me, that like that bar with at that time, a different era than you grew up with, I'm sure, but with a rainbow flag outside of it, it told me like that was a beacon for me to know, like that's where it was a safe space for me, which a lot of people in, who are now coming of age, maybe they don't need that, but they don't have that opportunity because so many queer spaces are collapsing. Uh, but like you mentioned, like for as I said, I said earlier, many people think of going to the gay bars in the 70s or the 80s as a, as a form to escape the worries of the work week or of homophobic society. But when they entered there, they, I, they're not really, as much as they were trying to escape politics, those bars themselves were political, right? One, like you said, they're learning what it means to have a community. They're learning, you know, how to talk like a gay guy, right? Um, how to flirt for the first time with men, being in a room with only men, right? Which is pretty shocking to so many people. But also the, some of the worries that they were trying to escape are actually in those bars too, right? That sometimes people encountered racism and sexism and uh, other forms of discrimination based on gender identity, right? Or you're too much of a sissy femme guy, you're too masked, right? Like you have all these other political things that are happening in the bars, even though so many people are going there to escape that. And so that's why for me, like the nightlife as an institution, is a perfect place to look at both 
pleasure and but also looking at politics and the politics of pleasure and you can learn a lot about people about trying to figure out what they're trying to do to have fun uh, and the way people try to police fun yeah i noticed um in your project um mapping the gay guides you use the word gay mm-hmm. and i use the word gay in my project as well because first of all in my history everything was gay there was no lgbtq there were no alphabet soup acronyms it was gay and then you know there were gay women there were gay men there were gay bars there were gay restaurants but that was it you know it was just a generic term that kind of meant the same thing as queer Mm. you know um and you of course were focused on in this mapping the gay guys project um recording information from Damron's guides, which again used the word gay and were focused on gay male establishments in the beginning anyway. Mm, do you get sure. any do you get any backlash from that? Do any people come <laughs> beat you on the head and say, we don't use the word gay anymore. That's not the right word to you. <laughs> you should have called it. You know me, you know me too well, Art. Uh, yes, it definitely comes up. Um, it's funny, I'll give you a, I, I always, I've been teaching now at Cal State Fullerton for a couple of years now. Um, and I, I get to teach this intro, Introduction to American Studies class. And I teach it kind of as a broad US survey. We start with the colonial era, we end in the in the present. But by the time we get to the 1950s, we start talking about the lavender scare and whatnot. And I often, uh, the first time I talk about gay people, I'll, I'll use the word homosexual. And it's just so funny because like this this generation of students now, 18 year old, 19 year olds, they're so sensitive to that word. So they're always like, I can't believe to use that word. I mean, they should know I'm gay. I'm pretty outwardly, you know, gay. I think I'm gay, <laughs> but they, some of them don't, I guess. And they're like, oh my gosh, is my teacher homophobic? And it's like, uh, but then I, 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 I say that story because I, and the nice thing about being a historian is I try to use, based on the historical period I'm talking about, I try to use the word that's closest to the what the majority of people would say. So like homosexual, before there was homophile, no one used the word homophile anymore, right? Um, but like you said, gay becomes the very, very popular term beginning. I mean, there's the word gay is being used at, you know, euphemistically beginning in the 20s and 30s, but really by, you know, so many people know, by the time they know about their homosexuality in the 50s and 60s, they're using the word gay. And it means, like you said, exactly what you said. Like so many people use it to mean this broad base of same-sex attraction or queerness today would be used. Eventually, though, that term is, you know, debated, especially among lesbian women who want their own term to define their love and attraction to what who, who they love um and eventually like this i now we're debating terms about what how to call a community eventually queer is a kind of a, a reclaiming of the word it's also a, a word that people think it should apply to everything which is not always true right um and I, you're right i do use gay i use gay for both of my major projects that i've done digitally which is back into gay guides and wearing gay history and i have gotten a lot of pushback about that like why isn't it wearing lgbtq history or something um i think the reason why i choose gay is to me it is the number one it's the largest historical group that often the main group of the projects that i'm talking about so to give you an example wearing gay history involves almost five thousand t-shirts in that collection the vast majority of them deal with um, with people who would themselves in the historical period that the t-shirt is talking about would call themselves gay. Not all of them, but a lot of them are. Um, Mac and the Gay Guides, at least in the beginning, is mostly a project tailored. Um, the, these, these address books were tailored to white men, white gay men, not all white, but mostly gay men. A lot of them were white in San Francisco. Um, so that word is just easier. It's also just like, it, it's an easier word. I think queer, the, I'm trying to think about how to say this. Um, I think queerness uh, or using the queer label or trying to be more specific and adding everyone's letter can get a little bit uh, tedious because there's so many letters that you can add or forget, right? LGBTQIA or something. Uh, and even, there's even longer ones than that. It's, it's nice to have a word like queer that's all encompassing. Um, but I'm trying to also be a historian and try to acknowledge that that's not how many people that use these guides refer to themselves as. So at least for Mac and the Gay Guides, when debating about what to call our project, we thought about maybe um, mapping uh, the queer guides, but there's just not a lot of gay men in the 60s and 70s and into the early 80s that would call themselves queer yet. Um, so it just didn't seem like the right word for us. So we definitely use the word gay. I'm not ashamed by saying this. I'm, I, I'm fine with people who who don't like that term um, used as, as widely to you know title a project because they feel it's isolating to lesbians or bi people or trans people or just queer people in general. I understand that, but I think for historical project, I think it's easier to justify than non-historical projects. And so that's why we chose it. 
Yeah, and I kind of feel the same way because not only in the historical context of when most of the bars existed, because my project started out exclusively focusing on bars that are defunct. Mm -hmm. Since then, I have added some bars that are still operating, some of which have been uh, in existence for 50 or 60 years, mm -hmm. but uh, which is, is particularly rewarding. But um, most of the most of the bars would have referred to themselves as gay bars. So that was kind of the first reason. But another reason too, is in doing the research, I noticed that you find more results with using the word gay because international listings in a lot of other languages have adopted the word gay as their version of what they would refer to a bar that um, serves homosexuals. They right. don't use LGBT. And if they do use an acronym, it's often different because their words for those parts of the community are different. Uh, and I noticed recently in Canada, several of the ones I've looked at in Canada start off with two S. Mm. Those are the indigenous two spirit um, right. concept. So, I mean, there's so many options out there, but totally. I kind of, I, 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 gay is an umbrella that kind of covers the general gist of what I was trying to talk about. Right. And, you know, in 50 years, when historians are writing about us, they will, or writing about me, or I don't know if they're going to write about me. I'm not that important. But I'm saying, like, <laughs> they're going to call by this generation. They're going to be like, this was the pre-queer generation. I don't know about something about that. You know, but that's very possible. And that's okay. Like, new times means new ways of referring to communities. And that's totally fine. Um, and we should embrace that. I, the, the nicest man I ever met in my entire life, my father, uh, once told me when I was a kid, he's like, you're never going to please everybody. So once you stop trying to please everybody, you're going to have a happier life. Uh, and I think about that, like as long as you justify why you've made the decision of using the word gay, like the gay bar archives or Mac and a gay guides or wearing gay history, as long as you can justify it and you're, you're acknowledging that it's not a perfect label, or whatever, you're totally fine. You know, you can move on from it. It's the people who, 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 who overly struggle and overly think about it too much that, you know, it's like, that's the, that, it, the name is not the only reason why you're doing the project, right? The project is supposed to expose other right. things and the name is just, it's just one aspect of it. Absolutely. And there's, you know, there's so much information out there that, I mean, I, you can't possibly use all the, the descriptive words that would apply in the title of a project because it, it would be ridiculous. But in the context 100%. of, in the context of like on my website, I use the words interchangeably. I use LGBT, I use queer, I use gay, homosexual sometimes for various reasons. Right. So people should pretty much get the idea that it's, you know, it is what it is. I teach Puritan history in early in my in a, in a intro course, and the Puritans would not have called themselves Puritan. They would be mad about that, right? They would call themselves Congregationalists, but they would never call themselves Puritans. But we, we call them that Puritans. It's a different era. And that's totally fine. Now I um I was looking at um, at the mapping the gay guides um, interactive map today, and it occurred to me that there was another use, and it's going to become come in handy, very handy for me, um, because over the last couple of years, I've documented a couple thousand gay bars that no longer exist in places all over the country, but one yeah. place I have never been able to find a gay bar through all of the um, archives I've looked at, the newspaper articles, magazines, even on the Gay Bar Archives group in Facebook, which has over 5,500 members, I have wow. never found anybody who could give me the name of a gay bar in this state. The only state in the U.S. I could not find a gay bar in. And I found it on Mapping the Gay Guides when I was looking Oh, today. wow. That's um, awesome. <laughs> and that state was Wyoming. Oh, really? Now, if you look at the Wyoming listings um, from 1964 on your on your website, there are only two entries, oh. which, as I'm sure, the smallest number of entries of any state. Probably. Uh, and going forward to 1980, I think it was only up to about a dozen. So, right. you know, it wasn't it's not like there's a whole bunch of them out there. But um, I have I have asked numerous times. I've asked thousands of people people who are from Wisconsin, people who are historians from, you know, different parts of the country. Have you ever heard of a gay bar in Wyoming? Nope. Mm. Well, apparently there were, and you've got them listed there. Uh, so now I, 
knowing that they existed and that they have names, it's start time to start diving into there and uh, and finding out more about those. Well, the only thing I would caution you with is that the the, the Damron, that not just you, I mean everyone, right, is that the Damron uh, guidebooks, the address books, are not just even though they're tailored towards gay men, they're not only giving spots that are what we consider gay bars, right? And by the way, that's a great. We have a whole discussion that me and you should have art. Like, how do you define a gay bar? How do I define a gay bar? Like, does it have to be gay owned? Does it have to just have a majority of gay clientele, right? Um, and so one of the things while you were talking, I, I was like fascinated by your, uh, your, your, your search for a Wyoming gay bar, which is an awesome project. Uh, I just went to 1979 and looked at the Wyoming listings. And there's only 15 entries in 1979, I think, of the Wyoming I- entries. But just looking at them in general, I'm looking for one specific thing in what we call the amenity features. And this is the coding list, right? And one that I, I noticed off the bat is in almost every single, it looks maybe even every single bar that's listed in Wyoming in 69 in places like Cheyenne and Casper and, and Rock Springs and Jackson, Wyoming, is that all of them have the letter M in them, which Our tells myth. us that or for mixed, right? So these are probably, I mean, I don't know this for sure. And many, some of them may be known as a gay bar that just happen to have women at them too, or straight people at them too. Uh, but it suggests to me that, that they're probably not selling themselves as gay bars, right? They're probably selling themselves as just a bar and gay people in this town probably think it's the safest place of all the bars in Cheyenne to go to. The other thing I'll note too, is there is an inn, the Hitching Post Inn, which tells us that it's a mixed place. It's popular because it has an asterisk next to it and it has E for entertainment. Um, but Dameron gives us a description information about the Hitching Post Inn, which tells us that it's the best bet. So what he's saying here is that like in Cheyenne, there's probably not a lot of places to go if you're a gay guy, but if you're going to have any luck finding somebody to hook up with that night or find people to hang out with and dance, um, you're probably your best bet is going to the Hitching Post Inn in the evenings. Um, so it's, it gives, they're, they're small little little clues. Um, and so it, this does not surprise me look, that you've never found a Wyoming gay bar because even Damron is suggesting that there's no, there's no place, at least in 79, that does not have an M next to it uh, in terms of bars, which is revealing. Right. And I've heard that from people in Wyoming too, that, yeah, there are bars that we, you know, we'll go to in a group or whatever that we're accepted at, but there are, are no gay bars. Mm-hmm. And, um, but my point was that by having that list of 12 places, at least now you have 12 places that you can start Google searching, including a name and a city and everything else. Because, you know, to just type in in a Google search, gay bar in Wyoming, uh, it, you know, nothing's going to show up. So right, right. at least it's putting you a, a little bit closer to finding out if there ever actually was a real gay bar um, in right. Wyoming. And also, like, and this is uh, this is what the importance of your project are, the importance of mapping a gay guy. It's like these are these projects. No one, we should think of our historical projects that we do, our archival work, whatever, not as you know, the totality of all things about gay bars, right? Your project is not to say it's doing a lot of work about the gay bars, right? But it's not the totality of it, right? You're telling us that like, these are stories from these bars. And really what I think about the great thing about historical projects like yours and mine is that you really want people to, to understand more about their history, but they're really the beginnings of future projects, right? Like you said, you want people to hear a name of a gay bar um, in one of your YouTube interviews um, that are awesome, by the way, everyone should check them out and go do more research about that kind of bar. Same with our research, right? Just because Damron said that there were no gay bars in Wyoming that were not mixed, maybe he's wrong. You know, start doing your own research on bars like the Hitching Post Inn or the Cornwell uh, Park Bar, the Holiday Inn Bar, right? And this will give you the beginnings of future projects. Same with mapping the gay guides, right? Not everyone's, no one's going to write a dissertation about gay t-shirts. If they are, that's awesome. But what they're going to do is hopefully find stuff within that archive to start their own projects, right? So one person I know um, who used mapping the gay guides, sorry, who used wearing a history, you know, is only looking for t-shirts uh, in, involving the pink triangle, this concentration camp symbol from the Nazi era that denoted homosexuals, right? And he wanted to see how the pink triangle was used by gay communities over a period of time, right? He's using our project as a starting point for his for his research. Same with your bar archives, same with mapping the gay guides, really the beginnings of future projects, right? Petri dishes for future gay history. Absolutely. Plant the seed. Plant the seed. <laughs> so... I know from our conversation earlier that you also have some personal memories of gay bars in the uh, D.C. metro area. And one in particular that you mentioned that I think um, is definitely worth talking about is a bar that was very popular there for about a dozen years. Um, I think it opened, what, in 2007, something like that? 
And that bar was called Town. So why don't you tell yeah. us a little bit about your memories of Town? Yeah, it's funny because when you interview people and you always ask them, like, I, I'm a nightlife historian, so I try to ask them about their nightlife and what they remember. And to be asked about, I never got anyone, very few people have ever asked me, like, my, my favorite bars and stuff like that. So it's just funny to, like, think, what are my favorite bars? And what do I remember? And having to have, like, dig into my memories is actually much more difficult. So I, it's a good experience because it teaches me, like, oh, how people have to really dig back and think about that. Uh, so I moved to D.C. in 2012. So the bar, I guess, town had been open for four or five years by then. Um but I, I guess this is a good conversation for us to have art because for me, uh, town, there were many gay bars that I went to in DC, a coming of age, uh, as a young gay historian in, in grad school. Uh, there was, there was the Green Lantern. There was, uh, 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 number nine. There was trade eventually a bar named trade. Um, there were lots of places that I went to. I, and I really enjoyed the DC gay community and, and the nightlife options that it offered. But for me, town was the, the best bar. One, because it was clearly a dancing bar. Not every gay bar in DC had a dance floor at this time. Then the DC has many historical major dance bars. I like think Nation was one, a couple other major ones in the Southeast quadrant of the city near where the ballpark is now. They, they were destroyed, I think, before the ballpark was built. Um, but for me, town was like really the only major place to really try to dance. There were other places, the top of Green Lantern had a dance floor, um, uh, but most like places like JR's just didn't have a dance floor. And town was, not only had a dance floor, it was a gigantic dance floor. And there was two of them, it was one in the, in the top floor and one on the bottom floor. And the reason why I mentioned you, Art, is I would love to talk to you about this. I mean, during my own research at the time, I had heard about these, these 1970s super bars. Uh, and you don't see it too much discussed anymore. But I know you know about them pretty well, because I saw it mentioned on your site a couple of times. Uh, and, I, and my own interest in these major bars that were beginning opening in the 70s, around the disco era. And there were really massive complexes uh, where lots of people went. They could, they could fit sometimes up to 2,000 people in them. They played different music based on different floors and dis different dance floors. And I'm not for sure if town was anything like that because I don't, I was not there to see the super bars, but it felt the most like that. <laughs> and it reminded me, and talk about you know, this will age me in the sense of like where I am in the, in the gay uh, historical timeline. But, you know, growing up, before anyone knew I was gay, but thinking that I was going to be ostracized from my family or whatever, I would stay up watching, I think it was Showtime, and seeing Queer as Folk, uh, the American Queer as Folk. And, you know, the number one club in that was Babylon. And for me, town was, you know, when I first went, walked into town when I was 21 or 22, it was Babylon, the first time I ever saw Babylon, right? It was, it was lots of people, lots of guys, um, and they were, they were huddled on these major dance floors and there was different types of music being played. And it was paradise for a young gay kid. Um, and I remember there's a great, there's, there was a, I eventually, there, there, you learn these little rituals that happen uh, about the gay bars in DC. So for instance, our ritual was we would, we would try to drink, um, we would go out kind of pre-gaming, if you will. And we would go, I think, starting at number nine, which I believe had the same owner as the town dance boutique. Um, and when you went there, you would, as long as you ordered a drink, they, you'd get a free admission pass to get into town for free. And this is the way to get people who were unfamiliar with town uh, and didn't want to pay the cover charge, because there eventually was a cover charge in town. Um, it allowed people to go to, to this owner, I assume, to get people to go to numerous ones of his bars. And so this was an incentive to actually stay out that night. So we'd start out drinking at number nine, and then we would we would walk, I think, 20 minutes, because I think number nine was on... Uh, was on Peace Street, and then we would walk about twenty minutes, you know, past a Logan Circle, um, and hit and go to, go to head to U Street and walk up to, to town. And sometimes there was a line, but when I first started going there, it was just a massive indoor complex. Um, but eventually, they it became such a very popular venue for the ten years or uh, it was open that eventually they opened up this massive um, patio, which was awesome because the DC summer heats can get pretty atrocious, and so to be to be outside. Um, and, and the nice thing about town's patio too, was it kind of reminds me of Palm Springs a little bit um, ca called by some gay historians, a city of walls. A lot of gay people loved Palm Springs in the 1950s and 1940s because you can go to Palm Springs and you could, you could be gay and be openly, you know, hanging out in your speedos or whatever. And no one could see you because you're the, 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 the parties that you went to ha happened in houses that had large walls. And the nice thing about towns, towns walls, uh, sorry, town, it was that the patio also had very high walls. So you felt like you were, you were separated from the straight community on U street and the straight bars of U street too. So I just, what I, lo I loved about ta town was that, uh, you know, U street is populated with lots of really cool, mainstream straight venues and then there was this massive massive gay club in the heart of that city uh 
in the heart of U Street. And it was it made it a really cool uh, cultural mecca, if you will, uh, at a magnet to go to. And then, you know, you would leave at two in the morning and you would head over to uh, this pizza shop on the corner that I'm sure that pizza shop made bank and still makes them. I'm sure uh, when, when it was open, it was making bank uh, because, you know, all these gay men were standing in a long line ordering a slice of pizza at night. Uh, and so that was the ritual, right? You started off in another bar. You took your free admission pass to go to town. You hung out there all night and then you had pizza and then you went home. Um, and the, the other thing that makes DC unique in the sense of like town is and places like town was unlike many, many cities, not like New York, I don't mean New York, but you know, unlike places like Los Angeles is that many people don't have to drive to the bars, right? You're taking the Metro to your home and what are you taking the buses to your home and that kind of uh, ability to, uh, to travel to different bars via walking or via um, via public transport is a different type of bar community than in places like, I don't know about Atlanta, but I assume different than Atlanta, different than places like Detroit, different than St. Louis, where those ability to walk to spaces is not so easy. And so you have a different kind of nightlife mindset. Um, so DC was great because for me, it was great because I didn't have a car and you can get to so many different nightlife spots without having to, to get um, behind the wheel. Uh, and not only for safety concerns, but also just um, for uh, yeah, for safety concerns mostly. Yeah, Atlanta was more of a driving town. Um, yeah. Although most of the bars, most of the gay bars in Atlanta were concentrated in, in two neighborhoods that are not terribly far from each other. Uh, they were either in, in Midtown or kind of the Cheshire Bridge Road corridor. Uh, but still, most people drove. I mean, hmm. and... Uh, for quite a while in Atlanta, it was a very showy town. So, you know, you didn't, not only did you drive to the bar, but you had your car detailed before you drove to the bar. Oh. And you had on a starch shirt and, you know, you didn't come in wrinkly clothes and whatever. You tried to make an impression, um, which is different than a lot of other cities, too. But right. um, Well, and just, and also that reminds me a little bit of like what town did. I mean, in so much that, like, I, I, I pictured it as Babylon. It wasn't just Babylon, though, right? Like, it had the ability to, it had, and this is why I think of it as kind of almost a quasi super bar. Again, I don't really know what a super bar looked like, but I want it could fit lots of people, but it also allowed different types of groups to to go there, right? So there was like a bear happy hour one night a week where, you know, people who can who consider themselves bears or people who like bears would go. There were drag nights, people who like drag at certain parts of the bar. Different music was being played at different uh, different uh, dance floors. And so I think that ability to appeal to lots of different types of the, the broader queer community, um, especially broader queer male community um, was really enticing. Um, and I think there's a, there's a grand, a, a new bar that's opened up in DC in the last couple of years, like pictures now. And I, I don't think it's similar to the, the scale of town by any means, but playing with that kind of super art concept where different floors are different types of music. The bottom floor is a different, it's a, it's a whole different lesbian bar, right? Called League of Her Own, I think. Um, so this idea like gay bars are are playing with how to be as encompassing to different types of bar patrons. Even if you're, if, if, even if you're only pay, appealing to gay men, not every type of gay guy just wants to watch RuPaul's at, on a 9 p.m. on a Thursday night or something, right? They want to do something else. They want to dance to different types of music. And so it's really interesting to see uh, gay entrepreneurs or people who own gay bars, I should say, um, try to um, to uh, raise their profits by appealing to a wider demographic. Yeah, and what I'm starting to see now is uh, some of the newer bars that are really making a splash in the in the scene are trying to be more of that queer bar concept, mm -hmm. yeah, appealing to you know having something for everybody, something for the men, the women, the trans, um, whoever bi, mm -hmm. non-binary. Um, and um, so I'm seeing a lot of that too, that the bars right, are being right. less channeled toward, you know, white gay men, which, which is, which is not the historically, it was not the case, right? Like it, in so much that like, I assume like this was my own research, right? Like if you wanted to go, if you wanted to, if you were an African-American man or you were interested in dating African-American men, right? You, you went to a black gay bar, right? That was the place to find people. Or if you were into the leather seat, you would go to a specific leather bar in a way that like people didn't think of the, of, of gay clubs or queer clubs as all encompassing as being meant to, uh, to target everyone. That's almost a more modern thing. It's almost a kind of an integrationist uh, ideology in a way that like, Gay men in the 70s never expected the gay bars to look all the same or to appeal to everyone, right? You went to different bars for different reasons. If you liked piano music or piano bars, you went to the piano bar, right? You didn't expect that the the the, the dance club was going to be, you know, having a, a piano guy hired to play show tunes on any given night, right? Right, absolutely. And we never thought of it as being exclusionary. 
any yeah, different yeah. than you would say, you know, if you go to an Italian restaurant and they don't right. serve um, polar sausage, you don't get upset. Right. You, you're like, that's why you're going to the Italian restaurant is because you wanted Italian food. Which uh, and the irony and the irony there is that the bars that were most I mean not, they're not they're not as mega as they are now but the bars that were most queer right in the sense that they appealed to the widest demographics were the bars that had to appeal because the those communities couldn't support individual absolutely. specialized bars right so like in smaller cities I don't and I, I don't mean like Indianapolis that's my my home state right that's still a very big city with many different types of gay bars I'm talking about like maybe places in Wyoming or in Boise or in uh, in Salt Lake City where, you know, the bars have to appeal to both lesbians and trans folk and, and gay men and bisexuals and Levi uh, leather folk and Western types. You know, they have to appeal to those many people because they couldn't survive without appealing to so many people. Right. Absolutely. It's just such an interesting adventure, looking at all this information, collecting it, seeing how many people are out there uh, like yourself, like Amanda, like, all these other um, historians and, and researchers that I've, I've spoken to that are enthusiastic about kind of filling in all the gaps of the gay history that has not been previously documented. Because so much of that, as you mentioned earlier, uh, was focusing on the political aspect, on the activists and you know legislation and things of that nature, and missing a big part of what, in my opinion, was kind of the mold that brought our community to where it is today it gave us the form and the shape of what we have today well totally world. and also like i think it's it's just not it's not a really honest perspective of queer people i'm using queer now but gay men or lesbian women to say that like you know everyone wasn't at stonewall that everyone was wearing the you know vote against prop eight buttons in 2008 right like P gay people are queer people in general have always been fully uh, encompassing human beings right and they sometimes ignore pop some never read a newspaper some of them read lots of newspapers right like and so like studying cultural spaces like bars and nightlife they give us a slice about some queer people who didn't care about politics right and if you don't focus on cultural sites as well you're like you said you're missing major parts of this this queer history that is super as important right we all we owe a lot to people like barbara gettings and frank kameny and bayard rustin like we owe a lot to all of these titans in gay history these major political giants right um but you know history is also made by ordinary people who don't think of themselves as activists too and just surviving people who are you know going to a gay bar and to find each other for romantic interest or to have a drink with a community or to go to a gay bowling league, those are important cultural stories too because it tells us that queer people have never always been in a perpetual closet or afraid to be open about who they are. And queer people are, I don't say they're just like everyone else, they're, you know, queer people are different like in, in many respects too, but they also have um, worries and concerns and desires that aren't focused on what we consider you know, party politics, right? Um, or activist politics, that they're they're having incredible cultural lives as well. And we should focus on those too. Absolutely. And I certainly appreciate all the work that you've done. And I, I'm really happy that you had the time to talk to us today about some of the projects you've worked on, as well as your memories from uh, town in DC. So thank you so much, Eric. Of course, thank you, Art. And thank you for all you do. You do an incredible project and I, I can't wait to explore it all. That concludes another episode of the Gay Archive Show. For more information about this episode, or to find more episodes, visit gaybarchives.com.